Okay, so thanks everyone for tuning in. This week we have Srivatsan Rajagopal from MIT, who's going to talk about his work with uh, Nima Lashkari and Hong Liu on modular flow of excited states. So uh, Srivatsan, thank you very much, and uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks for the invitation. So uh, yeah, so as Ro just said, this is the title of my talk, and this is the archive number in case you guys want to check it out. So this work was in collaboration with Nima and Hong. Okay. So this is the obligatory motivation slide. Why do we want to study modular flow? So this actually, we don't need uh, we don't need a very hard. I mean, we don't have to look very far for the motivation to study modular flows. So recently, there have been various versions of uh, proofs of the QNEC, the quantum null energy condition, and all of them involve modular flows of excited states in some form or the other. So there, there have been two proofs, and uh, the first proof where you assume a Hilbert space factorization of the uh, field theory uh, uh, of the field theory Hilbert space, and uh, one is where he you don't assume such a factorization. So both of them are due to Tom Faulkner, and in both the proofs, you uh, modular flows occur prominently, and uh, yeah. So the second uh, piece of motivation comes from the fact that. Uh, the emergence of geometry and the structure of the entanglement wedge for holographic states is tied to the bulk and the boundary model of flow of these states. So this bulk equals boundary model of flow is just the statement of the JLMS uh, uh, equality between the model of flows in the bulk and the boundary. So these are, I mean, this is basically some of, some of uh, a, a large number of other motivations for why we study model of flows. Uh, these are the immediate ones. And uh, yeah, so given these, it's actually, um, it's actually surprising that we only know modular flows in very special cases of high symmetry. So these examples are by now very well known in the community. So you have the, the uh, basic case of uh, the Rindler wedge, where you know that the modular flow is just the uh, boost that preserves the wedge. And then you have, this is in any uh, quantum field theory. And then in a conformal field theory, you know that uh, you can conformally map this wedge to the causal development of uh, the interior of a ball. And uh, yeah, so these are basically the only two non-trivial examples where you know what the model of flows are. And in both cases, you are only dealing with the vacuum of the field theory. And yeah, and there are certain other very specific, very, uh, specific examples in 2D, thermal states in 2D and whatnot. Uh, yeah, so the, so the the main point is you only know these flows for very specific states and for very specific uh, regions. And uh, yeah, so given the uh, points raised in the first two, uh, uh, so given the reasons specified in the first two points, uh, it's actually quite interesting to ask whether you can constrain or characterize modular flows for excited states and then check for universal uni universal features in those flows. So that is basically the broad uh, motivation of our work, and uh, and yeah, so so that's so the so this paper is basically the first step towards uh, such a study. So yeah, so what do we do here? So we yeah, so as I just said, we want to basically constrain or characterize modular flows for arbitrary excited states in the Hilbert space, given the modular flow of the vacuum. So we'll keep the region fixed. It could be any arbitrary region. So the only assumption we'll make is we know the modular flow of the vacuum uh, to as much uh, accuracy as we want. And given that, we will. So by the end of this talk, I will tell. I will basically outline a procedure to obtain the modular flow of any excited state in the Hilbert space for the same region. Uh, yeah. So basically, the tools that we use are basically uh, uh, mathematical structures of uh, von Neumann algebra. And uh, since any field theory is characterized by its uh, von Neumann algebra, at least good ones, so these results are basically universal across general field theory. So I'll not assume that I'm working with a holographic field theory or a conformal field theory in the subsequent. Um, yeah, so this next we, yeah, so here what I'm actually doing is I'm also outlining the strategy that we are going to do, that we are going to adopt to do this. So what, what we are going to do is we are going to take a particular class of states. I will specify what class of states we are interested in. And then we'll be able to write down something called the relative modular operator. So this, I'll also define what the relative modular operator is subsequently. So given this object, it's actually easy to construct uh, the uh, 
modular flow of that particular exciter. So, so basically the relative modular operator is the operator generalization of the relative entropy. So relative entropy is basically a quantity that compares two states and it gives you a number, positive number between zero and infinity, it could be infinity. Uh, the relative modular operator is the operator whose expectation value is basically the relative entropy. And uh, here we are not going to assume that our Hilbert space factorizes. So by now, I think uh, it has been appreciated well in the community that this is not exactly a correct assumption to make uh, uh, in the continuum at least. So yeah, so basically we are, so, so this is part of the uh, uh, motivation here. So what we, are doing, what we are going to do is we are looking for universal features in modular flows. And we also do not want to, uh, um, what's the word here? We don't want to commit to a particular regulator. So whenever you assume that the Hilbert space factorizes, you always have a regulator in mind. And it's not entirely clear that the results that you get are going to be regulator independent. So this is the reason why we have to go through all this uh, functional analysis and uh, study of one norm and algebras. But in the end, we get universal results. Um, yeah, so basically, so, where, so this was where I was. So basically what we do is we construct this operator called the relative modular operator between between uh, well-behaved class of states. And it turns out surprisingly that this class of states is dense in the Hilbert, in the set of states in the Hilbert space. What do I mean by dense? So dense here means it's a functional analytic term. It means that if you take any set, any state in the Hilbert space, it can be approximated arbitrarily well by the set of states in this class. So that's what density means. So basically, any state can be written as the limit of a sequence of states from this class. Uh, and this, this fact that this class of states that we are dealing with, so, so you'll actually see that this class comes out, comes about naturally when we study this object, the relative modular operator. And it turns out very surprisingly and very nicely that this class is actually dense. And there are certain continuity arguments that you can make to, so once you know the modular flow for these dense class of states, you can actually construct the modular flow for any state using a continuity argument because all the, all the operators involved are unitaries and they are continuous functions of uh, the modular parameter T. Uh, yeah, so this is basically the summary of what I'm going to do. So if you have any questions at this point, um, I'll be happy to address them. Otherwise, I'll move, move forward. Over here, we're okay. Uh, okay, okay, yeah. So what exactly is a modular flow? So the aim of, um, sorry. So I thought someone had a question or something. Uh, no, I guess not, but we'll, we'll switch off our uh, microphones so that like, we make some noises, we're not gonna hear us. Uh, okay, 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 okay. Yeah, yeah, so, so in modular theory, what we do is we have a one norm in algebra. So what do we mean by a one norm in algebra? Um, so to define a one-norm algebra, we first have to have a notion of what we mean by a C-star algebra. A C-star algebra is basically a norm, so it's an algebra, so you can add and subtract elements, you can multiply elements, and you can take the Hermitian conjugate. And in, and in addition, a C-star algebra is also a Barnard space. This means that it has a norm, and uh, the, multiplication and uh, the multiplication operation is continuous with respect to that norm. So these are basically the conditions that make up what's known as a C-star algebra. And if a C-star algebra acts on a Hilbert space, uh, then it, it gets some additional topological structure. And a one norman algebra is basically that C-star algebra, which is also strongly closed, which means that it's closed under the strong operator topology. Um, the strong operator topology is basically the topology of pointwise convergence. So, you take a sequence Xn of operators and you say that it converges to X in the strong operator topology if Xn acting on any vector converges to X acting on that vector. So that's what we mean by the strong operator topology. And the von Neumann algebra is basically closed under this uh, strong operator topology. Um, yeah, so this script A is basically what I, I'll denote uh, that. So this script A denotes a von Neumann algebra. Um, and we also have to choose a state. So this omega here is going to be the vacuum state. And uh, this state will actually satisfy the Riesz leader property with respect to the algebra and, it's, and the set of all operators that commute with that algebra. 
um, Riesz leader property is just the statement that if you take elements in A, act it on omega, you can come arbitrarily close to any vector in the Hilbert space. Um, yeah, so model, what model theory does is it introduces an dynamics on A, state dependent dynamics, uh, and study its abstract properties. By abstract properties, I mean domain. So you will always have a complex parameter that these uh, that this uh, dynamics depends on, and you can ask what is the domain of analyticity? How can you continue analytically, and so on. So state dependence comes from the fact that I choose a state omega, and uh, yeah. So modular flow is basically a set of unitaries u of t acting on the Hilbert space, which preserve the state. So you are for all t u of t omega is just omega and any element a in a is actually mapped to another element in a, a t dependent element in a. So th these are what, this is what we mean by a model of flow uh, associated to the state omega for this algebra a. And more precisely, this is how we construct it. So this is what's called Dumita Takesaki theory. Um, so many of you might have already seen this, but I'm just uh, repeating it so that we are all on the same page. So how do we construct this uh, U of T here? So we construct it by actually first constructing an operator S, an anti-linear operator S. <coughs> so it takes the vector A omega, A is in the algebra, to A dagger omega. So you can actually see that this S is actually anti-linear because of this dagger operation. And then delta is just S dagger S and S itself has a polar decomposition like this. <coughs> so J is an anti-unitary and delta is self-adjoint. So these are basically, so here I'm not assuming that the Hilbert space that I'm working on is finite dimensional. It could be in finite dimensional. And therefore these deltas and S's, they are basically unbound, they can in general be unbounded operators, which is where all the complication comes uh, in this subject. So S is called the Tomita operator and delta is called the modular operator. So delta is the guy that we are familiar in other contexts. So basically if you have a wedge, so, uh, so, uh, so how do we connect this to objects that we already know? So if you have a wedge, the wedge has an algebra associated to it. So script A will then denote the algebra, the one one algebra associated with the wedge, the, the, um, the complete wedge. So it's basically both the left and the right combined. There, is, there are no tensor factors here. And uh, you take all the operators that are associated with elements in this wedge, uh, all the operators that are associated with the algebra associated to this wedge, and then delta would basically be e to the k where K would be the boost that preserves the wedge. And this delta is the, uh, it's called the modular operator and J is called the modular conjugation. So it's an anti-unitary. So if you sandwich J, if you sandwich any element in the uh, algebra A bit and uh, sandwich it uh, by J, what I, what I mean by that is you take A and then you multiply on the left and right by J. So J A J will actually be in the commutant. It will commute with uh, all the uh, elements in A. And the U of T that I specified here is basically just delta to the IT. Since delta is self-adjoint, this guy is unitary. So this is the precise mathematical definition of a model of flow. And this satisfies both these conditions. Uh, so this is this is the theorem. So this is basically it's it, so people usually call this Tomita Takesaki theory. It's actually Tomita Takesaki theorem. So what the theorem is is there exists a delta like this, and you can exponentiate it, raise it to an imaginary power like this. T is real here, and then U of T will satisfy three conditions. So the first two is preservation of omega and uh, preservation of the algebra. And third is the KMS condition. So this is basically the, this is the, so I, I had just allotted one line here, but this is where uh, Tomita Takesaki theory actually come back. Uh, it makes a connection with uh, thermal physics. So this U of T, so if you take any element A in A, A in script A, evolve it by U of T, you basically get a T dependent function, a T dependent uh, operator in A. So you then take its expectation values in any state. So that will give you a T dependent continuous function on the real line. So what Tomita Takesaki theory tells you is that this continuous function can be analytically continued to a strip uh, of uh, whose width is unity. And uh, when you, so the analytic continuations on the ends of the strip 
are related by a switch. So if you take a times b of t, expectation value of a times b of t, if that is the function on the line, then if you shift t by i, so you just have to flip uh, b of t and a. Uh, so this is the usual uh, KMS condition that we deal with in thermal physics. And here it's proven in the more abstract setting. Yeah, so this is so this is basically the object that we are interested in throughout this talk. What is U of T for general state? So some things that I have not uh, specified here in the slides, but which you should always keep in mind is this delta, this operator delta is always associated with the choice of omega. So this is what I meant here by state dependent dynamics on A. Yeah, so if you change omega, this delta and u of t will change. And what we are trying to do is we are trying to study it for other excited other states for states other than omega. Okay. Yeah. So now we come to two states. So till now we have only dealt with one state. So what happens when you do it with two states? So for two states, there is a natural general. Yeah, yeah. So um if, om if omega is the vacuum of, uh, of the quantum field theory, then uh, delta is, 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 the is, the, is the global boost generator or, or, or what? Oh, it's the boost generator only for the wind level edge. For the, so, so how, the, okay, so, so the, my question is like, uh, okay, good, good, good. So, 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 so what's also important is that the, there's like this subalgebra of operators, right? And that's right, that's right, that's right. So, so basically the region or the, the domain comes from the definition of this subalgebra. Exactly, that's right. But state, like uh, in this case, uh, well, I mean, is, is the vacuum, now probably you want to take like an example. Precisely, precisely, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I should have mentioned this. Delta depends on omega as well as your choice of algebra. So that's, okay. Where your, yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, 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 no problem. So that's where, that's where all the shape dependence comes in. So if you change your region, you're basically going to, you're inevitably going to change the algebra associated to that region. And that will inevitably change U of T. But here in this work, we are not interested exactly in shape deformations. So the, they, they are a specific uh, interesting uh, uh, quantities to study by on their own. But here what we are doing is we are actually fixing the region and we are only changing the state. So that's what we are doing in this work. And in the follow-up work, I think we will study shape deformations in this uh, setup. Any other questions? No, okay, so I'll continue. Yeah, so, so one very important thing um, which we as information theorists, which I should have noted here, is that Tomida uh, Takesaki theory by itself does not give you any information theoretic measures. So if you are accustomed to working with a finite dimensional Hilbert spaces where, you're, uh, where, where the Hilbert space factorizes, so you can work out these objects. You can work out what S is, you can work out omega. You can basically put in omega. Omega will be the maximally entangled state and uh, whose Schmidt rank will be maximal. And S, you can basically work out S, delta, and J. And then when you work out delta, it will actually be a tensor product of the density, reduced density matrices. It will be rho. So let's say your system is A and its complement is A bar and the Hilbert space factorizes as H A tensor H A bar. And uh, your state omega has a reduced density matrix rho A on system A and rho A bar on system A bar. Then you can actually work this out. This is a nice exercise to do. So you can actually show that delta is basically rho A tensor rho A bar inverse. So yeah, so in that finite, in that uh, tensor product, in that factorized case, that's what your delta is. And uh, you can actually see that if you take the log, so, so what we are trying to do here, we are actually trying to look for continuum generalizations of information theoretic measures. We want, so, in, we, so we, we have spent a lot of time studying entanglement entropy, but we know that entanglement entropy has these UV divergences. So one hope here is since we are dealing directly with the continuum, all the UV divergences should cancel. But the bad thing here is, or the uh, not so nice thing here is, if you take log delta and take its expectation value in omega, you'll actually end up with zero. <clears throat> so this is a point that I like to emphasize again and again. Tomita Takesaki theory by itself does not result in any information theoretic measure. So you just get zero here. So you don't have a notion of entanglement entropy in the continuum. What you do have actually is the relative entropy. So this is the reason, this is 
the reason why everyone these days is interested in uh, uh, these methods. So what you do is, let's say you now have two states, psi and phi, okay? And you basically just do this uh, song and dance again. It, it, instead, you just pick in a different state here on the right side. So instead of saying S A omega is A dagger omega, you say S A psi is A dagger phi. And you construct the corresponding uh, self-adjoint part of this S. So this guy, this delta is called the relative modular operator. So this is the thing that I was telling you about uh, all those slides ago. So this guy, from a mathematical and information theoretic point of view, it has very deep uh, mathematical, uh, very deep properties. So what are they? I'm going to summarize them. Uh, at this stage, we are only interested, for this work, we are only interested in, sorry. So, so sorry, uh, does, does this S has the composition into this unitary, sorry, anti-unitary part? That's right, that's right, that's right, that's right. I didn't write it down here, but again, it, it has something similar to this. Yeah, good, good, yeah, sorry for that. The point is, I, we are not interested in that. Yeah. Sorry, uh, when you define this operator for two states, you just mean this operator now leaves both the states and varying and the algebra. Is, is that really? Sorry, sorry, I, I didn't catch you. So, uh, this, when you define this operator now for two states, uh, yeah. by that you mean this, state, uh, this operator now leaves both the states and varying and the algebra. No, 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 no. So, we'll actually talk about how it. Uh, how the corresponding unitary group changes. So I haven't, I haven't gotten there yet. That is, uh, the, yeah, that's part of these deep mathematical properties that I'm going to talk about. No, sorry, so I'm talking about the definition of S, S phi psi. Yeah, so if you take A to be the identity, you can actually see that S psi is phi. So it's not leaving psi invariant. Okay, oh, right, oh. Yeah. So this is, yeah, so this is the reason why this delta phi psi is so, such a powerful uh, guy. Since it doesn't leave psi invariant, you can take log delta and take its expectation value. And what you get, this is Araki's definition. So if you had replaced this delta phi psi by delta phi, delta psi psi, which would be the modular operator of psi, as I just told you, this will be zero. But this guy, because of this uh, thing, this is non-zero. So, I mean, uh, as, I mean, if you just look at it uh, from a first, I mean, if you just look at it, uh, you, you, if you just take an overview here, you'll actually see that this is, this is some positive number. You don't have any uh, uh, idea of what that number is. But what Araki showed is that this guy actually behaves like an information theoretic relative entity. And since here we are not, uh, we are dealing directly in the continuum, we are not uh, imposing any regulator, this is basically the continuum version of the relative entropy, and it's going to be unambiguous in the UV. Okay. So this, uh, is, is there any simple way to understand this operator for a tensor product space? Yeah, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you take, uh, good, good, good. So you can actually do the same exercise that I told you before. Yeah. Okay. And uh, if you take two states now, let's say psi and phi, and let's say the reduced density matrix of psi for A is basically rho, and the reduced density matrix for phi for A bar is sigma. Then you can actually show, the calculation is exactly the same, you can actually show that delta is rho tensor sigma inverse, or some uh, flip of that, I might be getting it wrong. But yeah, but that, that's an easy thing to do again. And you can actually, uh, you can actually, sorry, Sorry, someone had a question? No, no. Yeah, so if you take the log of that object, rho tensor sigma inverse, and use the fact that psi and phi are pure states, and if you plug this in here, you'll basically just get the usual definition of uh, relative entropy between two density matrices for region A. Yeah. Yeah. So, the, the calculation is basically exactly the same. <coughs> Question that, that 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 is very naive because I know very little myself about uh, this field. Um, where does the, the the fact that we're dealing with say relativistically invariant system uh, sits in a sense? Oh no 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 no. At this point, there is no yeah. At this point, this is any quantum system. So this is any quantum system that has <coughs> that has an associated von Neumann algebra of observables. So relativity sets in when you make additional so. 
in relativity, what happens is this log delta can be written in terms of the generators of the point category. So that's a separate field in itself. So I haven't added in relativity yet as of now. So I'm just talking about the quantum mechanical part of it. So, so basically, any, any Hamiltonian that, that, that uh, I have, say, on the lattice, uh, yeah. would do and like you can run this, this story there and uh, it can keep that's right. That's right. Yeah. So, in the la so, so this is well defined on the lattice, and it's a generalization of that lattice expression for the continuum. If you can, so, so, so the basic difficulty in this field is how do you find the uh, algebra associated to a region? So that is the question. So once you can figure that out, so these things are basically just manipulations. Yeah. And, and in, in relativistic quantum field theory, right, like, uh, you, you might look at the color development of the region, right? Um, and then like when you talk about the algebra, you think that, say about the algebra living in the quantum diamond, right? That's right. That's right. Sorry, sorry. Did you? Uh, I I didn't catch that last part. Well, well, what I mean is, I suppose that like uh, you you think of um, uh, say uh, a relative sequence of filter, like your subregion is 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 a ball, right? Then that's you can, right. You can look at the causal diamond that is found by exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. That's right. So the algebra must be associated with uh, causally complete regions and not just the uh, spatial slice. That's right. Okay, very good. But then, like, if you look at the spin chain, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, I have like a slice, very good. But like, the spin chain Hamiltonian can be very non-local, right? It can come from things that are like very far away. Okay. How to think about the algebra there? Uh, I mean, I can talk, I can think of algebra on a on a time slice. That's that's perfect, right? But it, it didn't look to me that you make as, like assumptions about the kind of Hamiltonian that generates the downside. No, no, no. So when you associate an algebra with the system that has time dependence, so you actually have to factor that time dependence in. So whenever we talk about, so for example, let's say if you have a local field theory, right? And the prototypical example of local operators is just you take any, you take all the fields in the theory and you smear them against some functions f of x, so which are nicely behaved short space functions. So the point here is this phi of x, the uh, operator that you're smearing it against, that should satisfy the uh, equations of motion. That you have to ensure that in your spin chain example too. Okay. Yeah. So it's basically a zero plus one system, and you can do the, you can do the same song and dance there too. Now the only the only point is I won't be any relativistic invariance, but there still be this time uh, shift, uh, uh, this uh, invariance under time shift, if it's time reversal invariant. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. So, so as this, uh, yeah, as this latest questioner said, I'm not uh, adding any relativity at this point. So that's why this is so general and so powerful. So it's any quantum mechanical system. So to fix notice, uh, to fix intuition, you can actually work these things out in simple textbook quantum mechanics problems, and you basically end up with what you intuitively ex expect. The non-trivial part is this continues to hold in infinite dimensional systems, which is why we are interested in uh, these, uh, this approach. <clears throat> okay, so this was the first. Yeah, so I said that this object delta phi psi has mathematical and information theoretic properties. So this is the information theoretic part of it. So you can basically prove uh, monotonicity of the relative entropy. You can prove, uh, yeah, whatever, whatever your favorite uh, information, uh, yeah. Uh, well, strong subadditivity, whatever. Yeah, so all those uh, information theoretic properties of the relative entropy will satisfy. So this is proven in this paper by Araki. So this is the information theoretic part. The mathematical part, the, the thing that we, that is useful for us is this object. So some other person actually asked what happens. Yeah, so they didn't ask exactly this question. So they asked what is the corresponding uh, uh, unitary group that this relative modular operator generates. So what mathematicians like to do is instead of just looking at delta phi psi to the IT, they look at this combination. And this is called the unitary cycle. So this last object, so this has a list of very important and nice properties. But for our purposes, we just need to remember two of them. So here the notation is somewhat, I haven't introduced it before. So what's happening here is sigma phi t of a is basically the modular flow with parameter t of operator a in the state phi, okay? And what this guy, what this guy does, this unitary go cycle, it intertwines between the two modular flows. So this is the reason why we, are, we 
directly look at this object, this unitary co-cycle. Because once you know sigma psi of t of a, you can compute sigma phi t of a just by conjugating it by these unitaries. So yeah, uh, this is called Cohn's co-cycle theorem. So this is one of the reasons why Alain Cohn's is the founder of, is one of the founders of the subject. So this is, he discovered this. And he also discovered that this guy, you, so yeah, so this is a nice contrast. So this U of T that I wrote here, capital U of T, which was delta, just the model of, uh, the uh, modular operator raised to it this does not so this is a bounded operator but it does not belong in a okay so if you act this u of t with elements in the commutant you will get a non-trivial t dependence but what this guy is u phi psi of t is it's always in a so recall that uh, the definition of these modular operators you were uh, i mean i implicitly they depended on the algebra so this u is actually actually belongs to that algebra for all t. So this is in a non-trivial statement to prove. But yeah, so these are the two important properties that we should keep in mind, at least for the purposes of this uh, work that we are doing. Okay, so this is the unitary co-cycle. The co-cycle, sorry, yeah. Question, uh, what about the other, so co-cycle doesn't seem to be symmetric in... Yeah, yeah, it's not symmetric, it's not symmetric. Yeah, so you, you get a different uh, you get a different unitary when you flip psi and phi, but this relation continues to work. Yeah, but this, this relation you can in any way invert it, right? I mean, even the way you've written, you, you can take the unitaries on the other side. So yeah, but uh, yeah, so that's the point. So you can have the two. Uh, let me see. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So. So just inverting this relation, you get one uh, relation, but it's not always true that that's the only unitary that will do the job. Right. It's, it's yeah, you can, yeah, you can have other unitaries that do the job. So in general, it's not symmetric, but if you choose the states, if you choose phi and psi very specially, so I don't want to go into that detail, you can actually write down some relations between u phi psi and u psi phi. But that's only when you choose the states. Yeah. So, so there are. Yeah. So at this point, I should also mention this fact. So since we are dealing directly with the algebra, so what we should think of any quantum mechanical state on this algebra is basically a functional on this algebra. So it doesn't exactly have to come from a vector. So you can actually define any uh, functional that is linear and that's uh, continuous under some topology. Uh, so, but but in infinite dimensions, what happens is you have something called the positive cone. And that cone actually purifies whatever state you have. So this is a very important distinction between finite and infinite dimensions. So in finite dimensions, if you want to purify a mixed state, you actually have to add in degrees of freedom. You basically have to enlarge the Hilbert space. But in infinite dimensions, what happens is because the Hilbert space is already infinite dimensional, you can actually take any mixed state on the algebra and you can find a purification of that state on what's called a positive cone. It's a geometric uh, object associated with one of the state psi. I don't want to go into that, but if you choose the phi to be a state on that cone, then you can write down some relations between u phi psi and u psi phi. In general, you cannot. Okay. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. So these are the two important uh, properties. Okay. So so up till now, everything is. So this was basically a the uh, just a refresher or introduction of modular theory so now i come to what we have done so basically now what we want to do is given so i have omega which is the vacuum and i want to construct the modular flow of an excited state okay so as a baby step first let's consider these two states the vacuum and some operator phi from the algebra acting on the vacuum. So you can ask what is the relative modular operator between these two states. So yeah, so there are some caveats here. You have to worry about closure and all, but for most purposes, this will be the answer. So how do you check this? You just check this by plugging it in here. Okay. Just follow these definitions and this is what so this is delta, delta is the modular operator of omega and phi is the operator that creates the second state. Okay, so there are certain caveats that I'm not going, uh, that I'm not going 
that I'm not gonna go into detail, but yeah, there are some. <clears throat> so this is the answer for the simple case. What happens when you take two states like this? Let's say the first state is phi omega, the second state is psi omega. So that is a corresponding expression that is very ugly. I didn't want to add it in here. So you just check our paper, we have it there. So the take home message is, the important point is, if you want that object to be well defined, you want psi should be invertible, the operator is psi. So psi is going to be my reference state. Psi needs to be invertible. <coughs> and this op operator needs to be functional analytically well defined. What do I mean by this? So <coughs> phi is taken to be a bounded operator. But as I told you a few slides ago, delta omega is an unbounded operator. <coughs> So this guy in general, it won't be in the algebra and it won't be, I mean, it won't be bounded. <clears throat> what you can also show is that it won't, so since it's unbounded, the next question you can ask is, is it densely defined, is it closable and all? So in functional analysis, whenever you come across an unbounded operator, it's always a good thing to first check that it's what's called closable. Uh, so this guy, yeah, so, the reason why this theory is called Tumita Takesaki is because they spent lots of uh, time and uh, effort in showing that this S, which I told you was an unbounded operator, this is closable. So only if it's closable can you define an operator delta like this. So this is a mathematical uh, subtlety here. So what you can actually show, show with some uh, uh, involved uh, arguments is for general phi, this need not be closable. This will be unbounded, but it need not be closable. But you can actually, so this is part of the miracle that's happening here. So we can choose phi such that this is only closable, it's actually bounded. So these are the two conditions. So to recap, what's happening is I consider two states of this form, and then I'm writing down the relative modular operator between them. And for that to make sense, you need these two conditions. This guy needs to be closable and this psi needs to be invertible. So given these conditions, let's assume that these two operators satisfy this, one can construct the relative modular operator similar. So it's, an, it's a formula similar to this, but slightly more involved. And uh, once you know that, you can take its log using, so taking the log is an, it's a different uh, mathematical uh, problem in itself. So we have a separate paper on that. But uh, yeah, but the, the, yeah, it, it's a separate paper that's not included here. Only the results were quoted here. So we know how to take the log. We got, so basically, yeah, I can also summarize what's happening in the other paper. So what's happening is when you take a general unbounded operator and you uh, take its log, you want to write it in terms of nice modular. So you want to basically take a Fourier transform and write it in terms of modular evolved operators. So that's what we do in the other companion paper to this. And the upshot is we know what the logarithm of the relative modular operator is between two such states given these conditions. Okay. Uh, this also means that given these conditions, if these conditions are satisfied, we also know the co-cycle flow between these two and hence the modular flow of phi and psi. Okay. So please keep in mind these two conditions. Psi was invertible and phi was, uh, uh, phi was such that this object is bounded. So that's the, this is the summary. So this is what's going to happen. So now the question is, yeah, so you can ask, I mean, you're only dealing with a very specific family of states. And even in that specific family, you are adding in constraints like this. So already it's not clear that any generic state in the Hilbert space can be written in this form. So here phi and psi are bounded operators in the algebra. I didn't mention that here. So it's not clear that any generic state is going to be written in this form. On top of that, you are adding in these constraints. So this is the miraculous part. What's going to happen is, so the set of all operators phi, which are invertible, which have a bounded inverse, they, I'll call it script G, it's actually SOT dense in a one normal algebra. What this, unpacking this statement means, so if I, if I give you a one normal algebra, and you take the, all the invertible elements in the one normal algebra, in, by invertible, I mean boundedly invertible. So that set is strong operator topology tense. So as I just told you, uh, the strong operator topology is basically the topology of pointwise convergence. 
and in that topology g is dense in the von neumann algebra additionally the set of operators whose complex modular flow is an element of the algebra what do i mean by that so here i defined a modular flow for u delta to the it a delta to the minus it so here t was real so you can ask what happens if I make T complex. So that's a complex modular flow. And basically the set of all operators for which that complex modular flow is also bounded and in the algebra, we call that script J. That is again SOT dense in the one normal algebra. So this second statement, this was proven by Takesaki, I think. And this first statement is, it was found, I found it in some obscure French uh, paper. Um, yeah, so combining these two statements and the fact that omega is cyclic, uh, so I again mentioned cyclicity. So what do I mean by cyclic? Cyclicity means that if I take omega and act it on, act on it operators from uh, script A, uh, you get a set of states. That set of states is again dense in the Hilbert space. Any element in the Hilbert space can be approximated by vectors of that form. So combining, so this is, so yeah, so let me be clear. So these things were already known that script G and script J were uh, SOT dense in the von Neumann algebra. What we did, it's lemma two in our paper was combining that with the fact that omega is cyclic to actually show that if I now take any two states in the Hilbert space, so this is new, uh, this, so this statement, you won't find it in any, any textbook. So if you take any two states, alpha, beta in the Hilbert space, so you can always find a sequence psi n and phi n. Psi n is in script G, which means psi n, all the psi n's are invertible. And phi n is in script J, which means the complex model of flow is uh, in the algebra. So you can always find such a sequence such that alpha and beta can be uh, written as a limit of such vectors. So then this is continuous, this is strong. So what we are interested in is basically delta alpha beta to the IT for T real. So this is strong operator topology. This is con continuous in the strong operator topology. And since it's continuous in T, you can actually take a limit between, you, know, you can actually construct the relative modular operator between psi n and phi n, and then take the limit in n. So this allows you to construct, so this we know. So let me be again clear, so this guy, this last quantity, delta it to the phi n and psi n, we already know from here, from here. We already know this. And since we already know this, we can construct the limit. And in the limit, you will actually get the relative model of operator to the it. And once you get that, you can use the co-cycle theorem here to construct the model of flow of any state you want. Yeah, so that is the basic uh, thing that's happening here. So in this paper, we have basically done this. And then you can ask what, where do you go from here? As I just mentioned, I didn't put the archive number here, but there is a companion paper where we set up an expansion procedure to compute the log of any general self adjoint operator. So combining this fact that we know how to construct the model of flow for any state, you can now ask, so now we can ask about, we can talk about shape deformation. So what happens if you perturb the shape? So if you perturb the shape, you're changing the algebra. And if you're changing the algebra, you can set up this expansion acts as a perturbation expansion. And then you can ask, how does the shape deformation affect the modular flow? So this study, I think to the best of my knowledge has not been done in the continuum. So what people usually do is they assume a tensor factorization of the Hilbert space. And then you know how rho and sigma depend on the shape. And then they perform a perturbation expansion in that for that rho and sigma. So here we are doing it directly in the continuum. We expect some, uh, uh, I mean, uh, we expect uh, different properties here because the assumptions are different. Yeah, so now we can ask how the shape deformation directly affects the modular flow for general excited state. So this is one thing that I'm thinking about right now. And the other thing, the more interesting physical thing is you can deform, so you know what the modular flow is for vacuum and any excited state in a CFT. You can now deform that CFT with a relevant operator. You can just study this perturbation expansion and you can ask how the model of, or how the CFT model of flow uh, depends on the perturbing parameter here. You can, you can work this out in conformal perturbation theory and hopefully this will tell us. Uh, so this is basically the thing that's actually occupying my time right now. I can ask, I can ask, I can try to answer some questions related to the uh, 
model of flow and the rg uh, yeah but there are certain technical difficulties in setting up this uh, procedure uh, i'm trying to uh, deal with them right now but yeah but this is what I'm right now. and uh, i think yeah i think i should stop here Okay, so let's uh, take the speaker. Does anyone have any other questions? We have plenty of time. I have some questions. Yeah. Uh, maybe we should let other people go first. Hi, I have a question. Okay. Um, I'm not sure whether you already commented on this, but uh, is there a relation between the, the standard modular operator and the von Neumann entropy? Oh, no, no, no. So that's what I, yeah. So in the continuum, there is no, yeah, that's what I was telling it, telling here. So if you just take the log of this modular operator and take its expectation value in omega, you get zero. So there is no notion of uh, entanglement entropy per se in the continuum. Okay, so the only notion of entropy that I can relate to modular operators is the relative entropy. That's right, that's right. So you can, so, yeah, so once you know the relative entropy, you can play some information theoretic tricks to define quantities that look like entanglement entropy, but they are not a straightforward generalization of the von Neumann entropy that we are that we are familiar with. Whereas this relative entropy is a straightforward generalization of that uh, object in the uh, tensor factorization, say tensor factorization. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. No problem. Can I, can I ask? Uh... So I'm not actually very familiar with the subject. So a, a broad question is, so one, one motivation, which you just repeated again now was uh, of modular flows and defining the, all, all these operators is you want to uh, define, rigorously define some information theoretic, theoretic uh, quantities for field theories, right? So that's right, that's right. inspired by quantities for discrete systems or for finite yeah. systems. Exactly. Uh, is there any, do, do we get any interesting insights for discrete systems if we look at some uh, oh no the discrete case when you have, in the discrete case when you have this uh, tensor factorization all these quantities reduce to quantities that you are already familiar with so there's nothing new yeah 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 there is so that's the point here so this guy this relative entropy here it just reduces to trace rho log rho minus rho log sigma or whatever so yeah, there's nothing new that you can get for discrete systems. So that's why this is, uh, yeah, that's why this is so interesting. We don't know what's going to happen in the continuum when we do all these uh, sorts but of things. What about the modular flow, for instance? Uh, oh, modular flow is just conjugation by rho to the it. So that was already worked out by Faulkner and group, I think. So in there, they, so, so they have two versions of the, two proofs of the QNIC. So one proof was it involves these methods and the other proof was basically the old fashioned way. So they assume that the Hilbert space factorizes and you can take row to the IS and do the replica trick thing. But that's not, yeah, so that I'm not sure. So you can, they were already able to prove a version of QNEC for that. Um, but I'm not sure whether they got something new there. I don't know. I can't comment on that. I'm not that familiar with that work, but yeah, but that's some, that's, uh, that's a place where they have used the discrete version of modular flows to do something non-trivial. Right. And one last question would be, if you just go to your last slide, uh, you, oh, yeah. About relations between modular flow and RG. Can you say something? More no, no, I, yeah, it's still work in progress. I, yeah, it's, I just added it in, uh, at the end. So like, I don't have anything concrete to say right now. Yeah, but the point is, I'm still trying to make sense of this expansion procedure. So I have a very uh, formal expansion. I still have to see what the uh, what simplification I did. So I already simplified it a lot uh, in that paper, but I have I suspect that there are further simplifications that I can do, and then I'll I'll actually yeah, hopefully in another year I'll actually give a talk about this. All right, yeah. Thanks a lot. No problem. Oh, can I ask one question? Could you go to the uh, previous slide, I think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, so how did you construct this uh, delta phi n, psi n? Oh, 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 so this just follows from these. Yeah, this just follows from a generalization of this. So the logic is, I know how to construct the relative modular operator between these states. And you can generalize that to these two states. So, this, so if you know this, you already know delta phi n psi n. 
Okay. Um, but is this something you can check? Like, say you take, let me think, say you take a two dimensional theory, yeah, pair on the real line, yeah, the two states, one given by the vacuum and the other one given by uh, some thermal state at temperature beta. Okay. Could, can you actually reproduce by taking this limit the relative entropy between? Well, oh, that's a good question. Oh, yeah, I haven't done that yet. I, yeah, that's a good uh, consistency check. So this is what the mathematics tells you. I should definitely check that. I haven't done that yet. Okay, okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah no problem. So, so I have a question. Uh, I'm not sure it makes sense, but let me ask it anyway. Please, yeah. Uh, so is there a lesson from these considerations from the, from the bulk uh, modular flow? Uh, in oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There might very well be. Yeah, we are still exploring that aspect here yeah, now. So, yeah, again, I'm sorry, I don't have anything concrete to say there. So, yeah, that's something else that we are studying. I should have added that here too. Yeah. Yeah, aside from the fact that the bar, yeah, at this point, I don't know. That could very well be. And the, the, the last question on my side is like, uh, like as, as far as I understood the logic here, it was more like a proof of existence or like a constructive proof in which like uh, you know given a you know a, a sub region right you you actually get this 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 quantity delta right so so can <coughs> you use like uh, the, the stuff that, that, that you've been talking about to to sort of get the, the module operator for 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 in, in new situations well you don't get yeah so that's a good point so here this limit, this limit argument work because I'm looking at delta to the IT. So this limit does not work if I remove the IT. So if, if I only know delta phi and psi n, I cannot conclude that I know delta alpha beta. So that's why, that's why the title of this talk is modular flow of excited states and not the modular operator of excited states. Oh, okay. Yeah. So there are, I mean, it's very subtle. So one other thing that you can ask is, since you know delta phi and psi n, you can construct the relative entropy between phi n and psi n. So does the relative entropy converge to the relative entropy between alpha and beta? And the answer is no. So Araki in this, uh, so yeah, so it's very delicate. So Araki in this paper where he defines this, he shows that this relative entropy is actually, I think it's lower semi-continuous or upper semi-continuous, I don't remember. But the point is there is an inequality in the limit rather than an equality. So I can only bound the relative entropy between alpha and beta using this procedure. I, I can't claim that I know the relative entropy of all states. So yeah, so there are lots of things we don't, we cannot construct from this procedure. It's just that it's only, it don't, this only works because I'm looking at delta to the IT, which is a continuous function of T, which is why this uh, limit makes sense. Okay. Uh, any other questions? I wanted to ask you about this uh, comment on RG at the end, but I think I'll, I'll maybe, I'll send, I'll poke you, uh, I'll poke you offline uh, with some questions about that, I think. Does anyone else want to ask a, a question before we uh, wrap up here? Okay. If not, let's thank uh, the speaker again for the excellent talk. Thank you very much.